So good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to tonight's uh, uh, fireside chat. Uh, my name is Dr. Yuri, and uh, I'll be your moderator for this session. Uh, so tonight is going to be our 149th um, chat in this webinar series, and we'll be kicking it off with um, onconephrology. Uh, so that we're going, we're going to have the first topic uh, this after this evening, and. Um, uh, we are going to have an, an interesting topic on MGRS, uh, and the topic will be on an overview of monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance. And our presenter, our guest speaker for tonight, is Dr. Ellen Jaikal uh, Elias John, who hails from Treso, Kerala, India. is currently affiliated as Associate Professor with the Department of Nephrology at Christian Medical College in uh, Velo. Tamil Nadu. His academic journey includes notable achievements such as completing his internal medicine and nephrology fellowship training, uh, including the Glomcon Virtual Glomerular Disease Fellowship and the European Speciality Ex Examination in Nephrology. With a rich array of clinical and teaching experiences, Professor John has contributed significantly to the field of nephrology. His work uh, experience spans prestigious institutions, including Christian Medical College in the law, serving in various capacities from assistant professor to his current uh, role as associate professor. And additionally, he has uh, presented numerous papers at national and international conferences, earning recognition and awards for his contribution to nephrology research. Professor John is actively engaged in research projects focusing on areas such as glomerulonephritis, onconephrology, chronic kidney disease, and peritoneal dialysis. As a site principal investigator in multicentric trials and a reviewer for index journals, he plays a crucial role in advancing scientific knowledge and improving patient care in nephrology to academic excellence and clinical practice. He continues to make significant contributions to the field of nephrology through his teaching, research, and clinical responsibilities. Currently, Dr. John is doing a research fellowship and master's in experimental medicine in uh, McGill University. So welcome, Dr. Ellen Jaiko. The floor is yours and looking forward to an insightful uh, discussion. Thank you, Dr. Yuri, for the very nice uh, introduction. Uh, Dr. Lloyd and all the panelists and all the uh, all the participants over here who have come. Uh, this is my second time I'm presenting in uh, in African Nephrology Fireside presentation, and it's always an honor. I consider it as a big honor to come and present to you all. And I will present uh, a few things which I have learned and few of my uh, few of the things which I still need to learn, and I'll share it with you. So let's start with the presentation. My talk today is on uh, MGRS. To treat or not to treat. I have, I have. There are two things which I would like to emphasize in today's presentation. The first thing is uh, whether we. What the first thing is to look beyond the kidney. So many a times, what happens is, MGRS comes like a surprise diagnosis. Uh, you we do a kidney biopsy, thinking of a lot of a, a couple of differentials, and most of the times when an MGRS lesion is diagnosed it's not there even in our differential. So it's like something which is least we are expecting. So it's a nephropathologist who actually picks an MGRS lesion. The next step, what he does is he ref he sends, he tells us, he calls us and tells us, oh, this is a MGRS, look for a monoclonal gammopathy. Then comes our role, wherein first thing, what we need to do is looking beyond the kidney. And looking beyond the kidney involves two things. First, searching for a monoclonal clone and secondly, there are some lesions which are classified as MGRS, but can also be associated with other diseases. So we need to rule out other diseases before jumping into a diagnosis of monoclonal gammopathy. Then once we make a diagnosis, okay, yes, this is an MGRS, this is a monoclonal gammopathy. The question that then the tough question that comes is to whether we need to treat or not. And if we need to treat with what we will treat. And there comes the role of our hematologist, whom we need to work with close collaboration to convince the hematologist whether we need to treat or not. And also after starting the treatment, how will you assess the response to therapy? 
And many a times the question that the hematologist asks gives us is, okay, you have diagnosed a, a possible monoclonal gammopathy. We don't have a circulating monoclonal immunoglobulin. We are ready to offer you chemotherapy, but how will you assess the response to treatment? And that's a very important question. So there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of interactions that is required. It's not something which we can manage individually. It requires a lot of interdisciplinary care and hence the thing becomes a little more complex. So outline of my talk is first to classify MGRS and then I will I will give what I, what I feel is the best way to work up a case of MGRS that is looking beyond the kidney. And then I will give you the literature about whether we need to treat or not to treat for the major types of MGRS lesions. And then I will, will I'll briefly touch upon renal transplantation in MGRS patients, a few Indian studies, and I'll end up with an interesting case which we had recently. So the first case of multiple myeloma was uh, was diagnosed in the year 1844, and the patient's name was Thomas Alexander McBean. He, this was a patient who he was a uh, he was a, a, a resident of London, and he presented with severe bony pains. And he was examined by Dr. William McIntyre, who was a physician. And William McIntyre examined his urine, and he found a very interesting finding. And this is a letter that he wrote to. Uh, Henry Benz Jones, who was a chemical pathologist, regarding an interesting finding that he found in his urine. So this is nothing but what at that time, what we do and currently also what we do is we do something called as heat test to detect protein in the urine. So what is heat test? You take a test, you take urine in a test tube and you uh, uh, you burn the, you, you boil the upper part of the test tube uh, for around 15 minutes. And if you get a precipitate in the upper part, it can be because of three things. It can be because of proteins, phosphates, or carbonates. Then you put an acid into it. What what Mr. What Dr. Mc, William McIntyre used was nitric acid, but what we use is 10% glacial acetic acid. And when you put an acid, if the precipitate disappears, then it is not protein. It may be phosphates or carbonates. But if the if if the uh, uh, precipitate remains, then it is protein. So uh, so in that, so heat test is nothing but that proteins will precipitate when you boil urine in presence of a acidic medium. Now, when you in case if this is if this is a monoclonal protein, what will happen is if you further boil it to say 126 degrees Celsius for another 15 minutes, this protein will disappear. And then if you allow it to cool down back to 50 degrees Celsius, this protein will again precipitate. So this is what was, at that time it was not known, and, 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 and Dr. William McCantry was the first one who observed this interesting finding. And this picture is of uh, Dr. Henry Benz Joan. He concluded, he analyzed this urine, and he said that this protein is a hydrated deutoxide of albumin, and they labeled this disease as molisosium or softening of the bone. It was then over a period of years that in 1939, serum protein electrophoresis was first done and they found this M protein or M spike or a church spire peak. And in 1956, they found out that this M protein is nothing but kappa and lambda light chains. This is Gerald Morris Edelman and this is Rodney Robert Potter. These two uh, uh, notable people were the ones who were offered Nobel Prize in 1972 for the discovery of the chemical structure of immunoglobulin. So before we go into MGRS, we need to get a few basic concepts clear. So an immunoglobulin has two light chains and two heavy chains. The purple one is the heavy chain and the green one is the light chain. And these light and heavy chains are joined together by both inter and intra disulfide bonds. Each of these light and heavy chain has a constant region, which is written as C. And at the amino end, there is a variable region, which is written as V. So if you look at uh, the, the heavy chain, you can see a, a carbohydrate moiety. So the, the heavy chains are therefore glycosylated, whereas the light chains are not glycosylated. And this area, what you can see over here is a hinge region. And this hinge region is rich in proline residues. And this provides an adaptation for, uh, for an antigen to be placed in the immunoglobulin molecule. Now, uh, the heavy chains 
have a higher molecular weight uh, and, a, and your light chains have a lower molecular weight. Light chains are of two types. We have kappa and lambda light chain. And heavy chains are IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE, and IgD, or it's also known as gamma, alpha, mu, epsilon, and delta. So this is a basic idea of your immunoglobulin. This is how the International Myeloma Working Group in 2014 classified the various monoclonal gammopathies. So they said that monoclonal gammopathies can be either MGUS, smoldering myeloma, or multiple myeloma. And how you differentiate it, it's based on presence of end organ damage. So end organ damage was defined as CRAB. CRAB stands for hypercalcemia, renal dysfunction, anemia, and lytic bone lesion. Now, CRAB is absent in MGUS and smoldering myeloma. So only in multiple myeloma, you will get end organ damage. Now, then the other two things that you need to look at is the percentage of plasma cells in bone marrow and your serum protein electrophoresis, you quantify the M protein in, in gram per liter. So in MGUS, your plasma cells are less than 10 percentage and your M protein is less than 30 gram per liter. In smoldering myeloma, your, your uh, plasma cells are between 10 to 60 percentage and your M protein is more than 30 gram per liter, but there is no end organ damage. When you have both the criteria of tumor burden as well as end organ damage, then you make a diagnosis of multiple myeloma. However, things are not very so easy. So that is why in 2019, the International Kidney and Monoclonal Gammopathy Research Group, they reclassified the definition of uh, monoclonal gammopathy. Now, the main reason what they said is, now this immunoglobulin, monoclonal immunoglobulin is not only produced by plasma cells, this monoclonal immunoglobulin can also be produced by B cells and your lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma clone. So there are three clones which can cause monoclonal gammopathy. 90% 90, 90 cases are plasma cell, but it can also be because of B cell or LPL clone. So based on this, they divided into two things. Now to qualify for a disease, you should have a minimal tumor burden and you should have a target organ damage. Now for plasma cell, the same uh, myeloma group classification was used for the minimal tumor burden, but for the target organ damage, they added something called as slim crab criteria. So in addition to crab, your target organ damage also includes the following. So S stands for 60 percentage. So if even if you don't have any target organ damage, but if your bone marrow shows more than 60 percentage uh, monoclonal plasma cells, then it defines as multiple myeloma. LI stands for the light chain. So you do a free serum-free light chain assay, and if the ratio of your involved and uninvolved light chains are more than 100, then it qualifies to be a target organ damage. And M stands for MRI. If MRI shows one or, one or more focal marrow lesion, then it qualifies as a target organ damage. Now, when you come to the lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma clone, this causes something called as Waldenstrom's macroglobinemia, which wherein you have increased production of IgM. Okay. Now, here also they use the same definition of tumor burden, but the target organ damage is completely different because IgM causes a varied a set of symptoms like anemia, thrombocytopenia, organomegaly, hyperviscosity syndrome, peripheral neuropathy. And the third clone is your B cell clone. The minimum tumor burden should be a B cell of at least 5,000 cells per millimeter cube. And B cells cause something called a CLL, and the CLL can also sometimes cause monoclonal gammopathy. And their presentation is in the form of anemia, thrombocytopenia, lymphadenopathy, or hepatospinomegaly. Based on this, now they classified it into three groups. So the first group would be if you have both minimal tumor burden as well as target organ damage. In that case, if it's a plasma cell, it becomes multiple myeloma. If it's a LPL, it becomes Waldenstrom's macroglobinemia. If it's a B cell, it becomes CLL. Now think of a scenario wherein you have a minimal tumor burden, but you don't have, you still don't have the target organ damage. Then you call it as smoldering myeloma or smoldering Waldenstrom macroglobinemia or a low grade CLL. What if you do the test when you because of strong suspicion, but you don't still meet the tumor burden and still don't have the organ damage, then it's classified as either MGUS, IgM MGUS, 
or MBL. MBL stands for monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis. So this is the current recommended classification of monoclonal gammopathy. Now then what is MGRS? So you need to understand this classification to go to the next step, which is called as MGRS. Now, now we have a very good classification. We have a tumor burden. You have the organ damage. You have everything in place. And then what we found, found out suddenly is there are a group of monoclonal gammopathies which cause kidney damage but do not meet the criteria of, of uh, uh, myeloma or, or MGUS uh, or um, Waldensian macroglobinemia or your CLL. Then what will you do? So this is why we needed a new classification for MGRS. So MGRS is nothing but you have a clonal proliferation of either plasma cells or B cells or LPL cells, which produces a nephrotoxic monoclonal immunoglobulin, but they do not meet the hematological criteria of malignancy. So it includes all this group of people, which I showed in this groups. So you're, you actually fit into this criteria, but you have renal lesion. That is why we have this new classification called MGRS. So why MGRS is so important? This is because the prognosis of MGRS is different from MGUS. In MGUS, if you see, the prevalence is around, it increases with age, whereas MGRS, the prevalence is around 1.5 percentage. If you look at a MGUS and look at the progression to myeloma, it progresses one percentage per year, whereas MGRS progresses around 10 percentage per year. Prognosis wise, you don't treat MGUS, you just do a watchful observing obs observation, whereas in MGRS, if you don't treat, it will progress to kidney failure. If you just treat with immunosuppressions that you use for glomerular nephritis, they still do not respond well. And if you try to transplant these patients without therapy, there is a high rate of kidney recurrence. So now, now let's go to the classification of MGRS. MGRS is classified as into three groups. So we have organized deposits, we have non-organized deposits, and we have no deposits. So organized deposits can be uh, classified into fibrils, microtubules, and inclusion. So what's the difference between fibrils and microtubules? They look the same, but microtubules are a little larger in size, and they have a very hollow center. And they are classified based on electron microscopy. Fibrillar can be a uh, uh, the, something which we are all more familiar with is amylodosis, which can be AL or he heavy chain or light chain amylodosis. And there is another entity called as monoclonal fibrillar glomerular nephritis. Microtubular can be immunotactoid or cryoglobulinemias. And inclusions include light chain proximal tubulopathy, which can be crystalline or non-crystalline. And there are some rare entities which I'll come to, that is crystal storing histocytosis and cryocrystalloglobinemias. Coming to, uh, coming to non-organized monoclonal immunoglobulin deposits, which the most commonly which we know is your MIDD, that is monoclonal immune deposition disease, which can either be light chain or heavy chain or light chain and heavy chain deposition disease. Then there is an entity called as PGNMID, that is proliferative glomerular nephritis with monoclonal immune deposits. And there are some rare diseases which can also present with monoclonal immune deposits. No deposits would be your C3 glomerulopathy and your TMA. TMA can happen in, in presence of monoclonal gammopathy and it's very common in a syndrome called as POEM syndrome. P stands for polyneuropathy, O stands for organomegaly, E stands for endocrinopathy, M stands for monoclonal gammopathy and S stands for skin changes, POEM syndrome. Now, each of these lesions actually they deposit in different parts of the kidney. They may deposit in the glomeruli, like in a myelodosis. They can deposit within the tubules, like in monoclonal immune deposits. They can deposit within your proximal convoluted tubules, like in your LCPT, which can cause, which can present as Fanconi syndrome, or they can cause, they can, they can cause cast within your tubules. So now out of all the myeloma lesions, only myeloma cast nephropathy is considered as a myeloma defining lesion. So if you have uh, any of the other MGRS lesions, it does not qualify in calling as multiple myeloma. But if you, if you do a biopsy and you show the presence of myeloma cast, which is nothing but pass negative fractured cast with a surrounding inflammation uh, by a giant cell reaction, 
which is usually seen in the distal tubules. It and and if you look do, look at kappa lambda and it shows a monoclonality, then that becomes a myeloma defining lesion. Now, just to get familiarized with various types of MGRS, in AL amyloidosis, what you get is when you do a light microscopy, you will see a mesangial expansion. And you get something called as nodular glomerular sclerosis, which is also seen in diabetic kidney disease. And these lesions are seen not only in the glomeruli, you can also get amyloid deposits in the blood vessels, 60% cases in the interstitium, and rarely in the intratubular cytoplasm. Now, if you look at the stains, it will be mildly pass positive. It will be silver negative. It will be Congo positive. And immunofluorescence, myeloma is light chain uh, amyloidosis is usually lambda light chain. An electron microscopy will show fibrils of around 8 to 12 nanometers, which are randomly arranged and non-branching. Coming to fibrillary glomerulonephritis, which is also a fibrillary disease, uh, the light microscopy is usually an MPGN pattern or nodular glomerular sclerosis. If you look over the stains, this will be Congo negative, unlike amyloidosis. But there is a stain called as DNA JB9, which comes at positive in fibrillary GN. And if you look at the immunofluorescence, Fibrillary GN is very rarely monoclonal. Most of the cases are polyclonal. So what you see is usually a IgG1 and IgG4, which is polyclonal, and both kappa and lambda. And there's a typical pattern that the pathologists explain that in on immunofluorescence, they appear as a smudgy pattern. If you do an electron microscopy, the fibrils will be larger than the amyloid fibrils. Amyloid is 8 to 12, and this will be around 12 to 22 nanometers. So whenever you get a uh, very rarely, you we end up seeing fibrillary GN with a monoclonal picture. What do you mean by monoclonal picture? You see either kappa or lambda. So when you get such a confusion, what you need to do is you need to do a pronase digestion of the paraffin IF. So you take the paraffin IF, you put pronase and you try to look for any whether there are any masked polyclonal deposits. And in 50 percent cases, you end up seeing masked deposits. And in 50 percent cases, you will see that the deposits are truly monoclonal and most of these truly monoclonal fibrillary GN is usually DNA JB9 negative. Immunotactoid glomerular nephritis again presents as MPGN or nodular. All the stains here will be negative and unlike fibrillary, immunotactoid is usually monoclonal and it is usually IgG1 and it can either be kappa or, or lambda. And what you see on electron microscopy is microtubules, which are larger in size and arranged like parallel arrays. Type 1 cryoglobinemia also presents with an MPGN pattern, but there are two interesting findings which you can find on light microscopy. You may find presence of thrombi, which are not actually thrombi. Usually thrombi is because of fibrin. So if you do a fibrin stain, these thrombi will appear, this fibrin will be negative. So this is actually a pseudo thrombi because of cryoglobulin precipitation. And you'll see a lot of macrophages in the light microscopy. All your stains will be negative. Your immunofluorescence is usually IgM and it is usually monoclonal kappa. And on electron microscopy, just like immunotactoid, you will see microtubules more than 30 nanometers. But the microtubules in immunotactoid are, are parallelly arranged. Whereas if you see here closely in the figure, this is arranged in the form of a coma shape or just like your fingerprint pattern. So it's called as a fingerprint pattern or coma pattern. Light chain proximal tubulopathy is an interesting group of disease. I've seen only two or three cases. Now here what happens is your uh, immunoglobulin deposits within the uh, cytoplasm of your proximal convoluted tubule. So there are two types of LCPT. It can be crystalline or non-crystalline. In crystalline, you see crystals within the cytoplasm and lysosomes, whereas in non-crystalline, what you see is you see a non-crystalline light chain inclusion within the lysosomes and you see some changes within the lysosomes. The lysosomes appears mottled or you see some deposits in the lysosomes and that is termed as lysosomal indigestion or constipation. Now, crystalline LCPT is usually kappa and non-crystalline is lambda. Fanconi syndrome is more commonly seen with crystalline LCPT. So what you get in Fanconi syndrome, you get uh, glycosuria, amino acid urea, low molecular weight protein urea, hypophosphatemia, hypouricemia, hypocarnitinemia, and you get non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Then I, there are some rare crystal inclusion. One is called as crystal storing histocytosis, wherein what happens is that the light, the, the monoclonal 
light chains are taken up by uh, macrophages which are there in the interstitial. So what you see is you see the monoclonal light chains within the cytoplasm of your interstitial histocytes. And in cryocrystalloglobinemia, it's not the light chain, but the entire immunoglobulin gets deposited within the tubular epithelium or your glomerular epithelium or mesangial cells or rarely within the endothelium. LCDD or light chain deposition disease, uh, you get nodular glomerular sclerosis in 50% of cases. And one interesting finding is you find eusinophilic ribbon-like deposits along the tubular basement membrane. All the stains here will be negative. Whereas if you do a immunofluorescence, you see linear deposits of kappa, usually kappa. Kappa is more common along the tubular basement membrane, glomerular basement membrane and Bowman's capsule. And electron microscopy shows a typical finding. There will be no organized deposits, but what you see is electron dense powdery kind of punctate deposits, linear deposits along the tubular basement membrane. Heavy chain deposition disease, just like LCDD, presents with nodular glomerular sclerosis. But unlike uh, LCDD, almost all cases will have nodular glomerular sclerosis. All stains will be negative. And HCDD is usually caused by IgG1 or IgG3. And the electron microscopy picture will be exactly same as LCDD. PGNMID has four stages. And most of the cases we see in the membranoproliferative glomerular nephritis or the stage four, all the stains will be negative. The immunofluorescence will show IgG, which is usually IgG3, and, and the monoclonal is mostly kappa. So 75% cases are kappa. And only electron microscopy, you see non-organized granular electron dense deposits within the subendothelium, mesangium, and the subepithelial location. Monoclonal C3GN is an interesting thing. So here what happens is that on LM, you get a, a MPGN pattern. On IF, you get C3 deposits and you think it's a C3GN. And then you, uh, when you do a monoclonal stay, you, when you do a testing for monoclonal gammopathy, you get a circulating monoclonal immunoglobulin, which will produce a confusing picture. Whenever you get a monoclonal C3, always do a pronase digestion of your paraffin IF to rule out sometimes uh, hidden or unmasked immunoglobulin deposits. Now, C3 uh, uh, glomerulopathy are of two types. One is DDD or dense deposit disease, wherein you get ribbon-like intramembranous deposits, or it's C3GN, wherein you get mesangial or subepithelial deposits. Now, I just after this uh, histopathological uh, classification, I will just give us a brief series of an MGRS case series from India. This is from Ames, New Delhi, uh, a case of 48, uh, C 48 patients of MGRS, mean age was 50 years. The most common presentation in two thirds was proteinuria. Uh, M spike on serum or urine electrophoresis was detected in half the cases. Serum free light chain assays were more sensitive, so almost positive in 60 percentage cases. And the most common MGRS lesion was amylodosis, AL amylodosis. Now, uh, now what we need to understand is each of these uh, MGRS, they tend to be more commonly associated with either one type of light chain or heavy chain. So if let's go to the light chain, lambda is mostly seen in AL amylodosis. Lambda is also seen in non-crystalline LCPT. Whereas kappa is more common with PG and MID, crystalline LCPT and with LCDD, that is light chain deposition disease. Whereas in fibrillary, immunotactoid and cryoglobinemia, they can either be kappa or lambda. When you go to the heavy chains, IgG1 is, com is the heavy chain seen in immunotactoid. IgG3 is the heavy chain seen in PGNMID. And IgM is the uh, heavy chain that is seen in cryoglobulinemia. Now, now, each of these uh, MGRS lesions, the chance of detecting a monoclonal immunoglobulin is different. So if you see the highest chance is, is seen with type two, type one cryoglobinemia, wherein almost all cases you can pick up a circulating monoclonal immunoglobulin. And it, it is usually IgM. Whereas it's around 90% in amylodosis, LCDD, and around 70% in immunotactoid and 60% in HCDD. Whereas PGNMID and fibrillary, the chance of detecting a circulating monoclonal immunoglobulin is very less. The same is with your multiple myeloma. The rates of myeloma are also not 
are very less. The highest rates, what you can see, is with LCDD, where you get around 50 percentage cases, whereas most of them are below 20 percentage. Now, if you look at the, if you do a bone marrow flow cytometry to detect the clone that is causing the disease, the most of these diseases are caused by plasma cell clone. Whereas in immunotactoid, the clone that is 70 percent cases, the clone is a B cell clone, which is CLL. And in cryoglobinemia, it is your LPL. So only these two diseases, the clone is usually B cell or LPL. Now, how we, what do you mean by a clone? The B cell, as it's a revision, the CD markers are CD19, 20, and IgM, whereas plasma cells are CD38, CD78, and CD138 positive. Now, why you have, now I, I said that in PG and MID, the chance of detecting a clone is only 30 percentage. The chance of detecting a circulating immunoglobulin is only 30 percentage. So why it is so low? We do not know actually. The hypothesis are, one might be the low rate of production and with our current tools to detect monoclonal immunoglobulin, it may not be sensitive enough to pick up these clones. But in spite of that, if you transplant a PG, PGNMID patient without therapy, the chance of recurrence, early recurrence is very, very high. And even in these recurrence cases, if you look for a monoclonal immunoglobulin, you detect it in only 20 to 30 percent cases. So that might not be the main reason why you're not able to pick up the, the clone. The second reason might be IgG3 is a most common heavy chain in PGNMID. IgG3 has some special properties. It has a maximum molecular weight. It has a maximum positive charge or cationic charge. It has ability to cross-link and it has a highest complement fixing ability. So as a result, what happens is this IgG3, because of its positive charge and ability to cross-link, it may go and bind to the negative charge glomerular basement membrane. And as a result, we are not able to pick up the IgG3 from the circulation. So this phenomena is called as glomerular sieving phenomena. Now, once you have made an MGRS diagnosis, the next step is the role of the nephrologist to look beyond the kidney. And what I, what, what I would say is we divide it into two groups. One is the test that we need to do for all patients, irrespective of what is the MGRS lesion. And the second group of tests are the tests we need to do when we, when we do not pick up a monoclonality. So in all cases, you need to do a serum protein electrophoresis. Uh, immune fixation electrophoresis and a serum free light chain assay and a bone marrow examination. And ideally, a bone marrow examination should include a bone marrow aspiration to look for the percentage of plasma cells and a trifying biopsy, which should look for, which you do at immunohistochemistry on the trifying biopsy to look for whether there is the CD38 plasma cells are monoclonal whether there is kappa or lambda monoclonality. So you need to do an extra test of immunohistochemistry on the trifid biopsy. And in addition, what studies are now saying is we need to do a bone marrow flow cytometry to detect a pathogenic clone. Now, other tests that you do when you do not pick up a monoclonal immunoglobulin is a CT thorax, abdomen and pelvis, which is PET-CT, and a flow cytometry of peripheral blood to detect small clones of CLN and CLL and MBL. Briefly touching on serum protein electrophoresis. Serum protein electrophoresis is nothing but you do use a agarose gel electrophoresis to to break down the uh, uh, to break down the serum protein into various components. And you can see here the largest component is albumin. Then you have alpha one, alpha two, beta, beta, and gamma globulin. And most of your immunoglobulins are usually seen in the gamma region. Very rarely you will pick it up in beta or alpha 2 region. But the, the problem with serum protein electrophoresis is it can be falsely positive in a lot of other conditions. Like when you have fibrinogen or when you have intravenous hemolysis causing hemoglobin, heptoglobulin complexes, in nephrotic syndrome, in hyperlipidemias, in, high, uh, in iron deficiency anemias. It can also be negative in certain conditions like in heavy chain deposition disease in IgD and IgE myeloma, in light chain uh, secreting uh, non-secretory myelomas, it can be negative. So there are a lot of conditions wherein you may get a false positive and false negative. But still it has certain advantages. Uh, first advantage of serum protein electrophoresis is that it helps in quantification of your M protein. So you get the value. It's 10 gram per liter or 30 gram per liter or 40 gram per liter. So you can quantify your M protein. 
The immunofixation electrophoresis, the advantage is that it is more sensitive. So the serum immunofixation electrophoresis can pick up as low as 0.2 gram per liter. And you can also determine the type of heavy chain and light chain. However, the disadvantage is that you cannot quantify the M protein. Serum-free light chain assays are even more sensitive. And in serum-free light chain assays, you can actually help. It helps in, in prognosis. It helps in the follow-up of patients who are treated as, who was diagnosed as monoclonal gammopathy. Now, what we need to know, what we look at is the kappa light chain and the lambda light chain. And you look at the ratio of kappa is to lambda. The normal kappa lambda ratio in bone marrow is 2 is to 1. But if you look in the blood, the normal ratio in patients without renal failure, it is 0 0.26 to 1.6. But once you have renal failure, the ratio kinds of shifts to the right. That is, it becomes 0.3 to 3.1. So a majority of our patients, the ratio is around 0.3 to 3.1. Now, once now before once you before you start treating a patient with MGRS, hematologists use a lot of terminologies. They're very simple actually. We need to get oriented to these terminologies. Unless we know these terminologies, it becomes very difficult to communicate with your hematologist. So the first terminology that you need to know is something called as DFLC. DFLC is nothing but it is a difference of your free light chains. It is an it is it is a difference between your pathogenic light chain and your non-pathogenic light chain. So let's say if you have a kappa G, PGNMID and you have a circulating a monoclonal immunoglobulin which is kappa. Then what you do is you minus your kappa light chain, uh, the value of your kappa light chain from your lambda light chain. Now the baseline DFLC is a DFLC when you diagnose and the nadir DFLC is the lowest post-treatment DFLC. Now what is complete remission? Complete remission is when you, you, when you treat the patient and you find a normal immunofixation electrophoresis and a normal serum-free light chain assay. Then there are a lot of other criteria of which the most important I would say is VGPR. And I will explain why VGPR is the most important criteria. VGPR is very good partial remission. It means that there is a 90% reduction in your from your baseline DFLC. So you treat your uh, monoclonal gammopathy and your, from your baseline DFLC, your nadir DFLC decreases by 90%. Or you can say your, your absolute DFLC is less than 40 milligram per liter. Now, why it is so? It is so because if you achieve a VGPR or anything above VGPR uh, with patients with MGRS, the kidney outcomes are better. So your aim should always be to attain your VGPR. Then there is something called as partial remission that is more than that is 50 to 90 percentage reduction in your DFLC and stringent DFLC, which means your nadir DFLC is even lower than your VGPR, that is less than 10 milligram per liter. How will you assess the renal response? You look for two things. You look for proteinuria and you look at your serum creatinine. If you can get 50 percentage reduction in your proteinuria or you can prevent, if you can prevent your creatinine from going beyond 25 percentage of your baseline, that means you have attained a good renal response. And there are certain diseases like PGNMID, if you don't have a circulating monoclonal immunoglobulin, then the only way you can assess your response is by looking at the renal response. Then there are some ancillary tests in MGRS, which I'm not discussing because of lack of time, which you do in certain situations when you find a difficulty in diagnosing MGRS. Now, what are the various medications that we have? Now, we have some cytotoxic agents like cyclophosphamide, we have proteosome inhibitors. The most, the most common which we all uh, used to is bortezomib. We have immunomodulatory agents like thalidomide and linalidomide. And now we have two monoclonal antibodies. One against your B cell, that is CD20, that is rituximab, which we use for a lo lot of other diseases. And the other monoclonal antibodies against the plasma cell, that is CD38, which is called as daratumumab. Each of these agents have their own side effects. We should be aware of these. Bortezomib causes peripheral neuropathy. Thalidomide is teratogenic. So it can cause something called as fico, fecomalia, which is nothing but the uh, congenital malformation wherein uh, the proximal part of your limb is absent. So your hands and leg arise directly from the trunk. Linalidomide can cause Fanconi syndrome and daratumumab, which is a new monoclonal antibody, which can cause cardiac toxicity. Now the first question now. Now we have, we know now we have got a diagnosis. We know how to 
uh, to uh, we know that we well, what are the tests that we need to do once you make a diagnosis. And now the question is whether to treat or not to treat. So what is the evidence? So this is the largest series of MGRS, 280 patients from 12 countries. They classified the MGRS lesions into MGRS amylodosis, which is the most common, 180 patients, and MGRS non-amylodosis, which included mainly patients of uh, MIDD and PG and MID. And what did they find? They found that, first of all, the light chain in MGRS amylodosis is usually lambda, whereas in non-amylodosis, it is kappa. They found the heavy chain in MGRS is in, in, in MGRS amylodosis is less commonly detected. That is because most of the cases were light chain amylodosis. Patients with non-amylodosis MGRS had a lower EGFR and also had lesser proteinuria. That means patients with amylodosis had more proteinuria and patients with no amylodosis had, had a lower EGFR. Now, a clone-based therapy was given to 87% patients. 16% patients received a stem cell transplantation, and they found that a similar hematological response in both the groups and stem cell transplantation led to better response than other treatment. What they found is the, the this is MGRS amylodosis and non-amylodosis. The survival was no difference in the no dif, no uh, it was not different between the two groups. Whereas when you look at Patients who attained VGPR, this purple line is VGPR or complete remission, they had a better survival. Patients who had the green line is patients without kidney involvement with a kidney response. So patients who had kidney response or renal response also had a better survival. So patients who had hematological response, patients who had renal response, both had a better outcome and they found that those who attained VGPR or above, they were more likely to develop a renal response. This is a recent paper which came in CJASN in last year. This is a retrospective study uh, in a tertiary referral center uh, where they, wherein they, they looked at all patients with CKD who had a monoclonal testing done. They classified them into two groups. One group was patients who had no monoclonal gammopathy. One group was patients who had MGUS. And third group was patients who had MGRS. They found that 42% patients had MGUS and 4% patients had MGRS. They found that patients with 16% uh, uh, patients developed kidney failure over the follow-up period of five years and 25% died without kidney failure. On uh, When they did a univariate analysis, they found that MGRS was associated with higher risk of kidney failure, which did not become significant on multivariate analysis. However, MGRS was a predictor of mortality. So what this group is saying is, if you have MGRS, there is high chance of developing kidney failure and higher chance of mortality. Now, this is a group of 255 MIDD patients in whom 64% patients had MGRS. Chemotherapy was given to 169 out of 255 of these patients and almost 60% received bortezomib-based chemotherapy. And the outcomes among these 169 patients who were given chemotherapy was very good in the sense the hematological remission rate was 67% even though the renal response was not very good. And the predictors of renal response was if you achieve a hematological response more than VGPR or if you do not have severe IFTA in your biopsy, you are more likely to have a renal response. This is another series of 49 patients of MIDD in which again, 38 had MGRS and 10 had multiple myeloma. For all 49 were given bortezomib-based therapy. And the outcomes, if you see, was very good. Hematological response in 91%, renal response in 26 out of the 49. However, 10 patients progressed to end-stage kidney disease. Again, if you see, what predicts renal response were attainment of VGPR, or very good partial response. This is another case of 53 light chain deposition disease patients who had a median survival of 5.4 years and a renal survival of 5.4 years and patient survival of 14 uh, years. Dialysis had to be initiated in almost one third of the patients. They classified these patients into two groups. One group of patients attained VGPR or complete remission. In this group, the EGFR increased by 6 ml per minute per year and majority were dialysis independent. And the second group had no remission. In that group, there was a loss of EGFR by 5 ml per minute per year. And most patients 
progress to end stage kidney disease. Seven patients underwent kidney transplantation and over a follow up period of 9.7 years, none of the patients had recurrence. So how do you manage AL amyloidosis? So in AL amyloidosis, the guidelines are quite clear. What you first do is you see if the patient is eligible for hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So if your age is less than 70, if you do not have multi-organ involvement, if you do not have severe renal dysfunction, you become eligible for hematopoietic stem cell transplant. In this group of patients, you first give an induction therapy with bortezomib for two to four cycles, and then you go ahead and do a autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant with high-dose melphalan. And then you assess the hematological response at the end of 100 days. Now, in those patients who are not eligible for stem cell transplant, you give four to six cycles of your bortezomib-based chemotherapy, and your aim is to attain a VGPR, at least a VGPR, by the end of six cycles. Now, why go for hematopoietic stem cell transplant? What they found is those patients, observational studies have shown that patients who do an autologous stem cell transplant, they have better hematological response. It inhibits the amyloid production. The, it also clears the amyloid deposits. It improves the organ functioning and it improves your patient survival and quality of life. But there's a problem with when you do when you choose your patients wrongly. There is a high risk of TRM or transplant-related mortality, especially if you have cardiac involvement, multi-organ involvement, or if you have a baseline blood pressure which is very low. Now, there is only one randomized control trial which tried to compare between autologous stem cell transplant versus, uh, uh, versus your uh, melphalan-based chemotherapy in patients with uh, 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 AL amyloidosis. Now, this randomized control trial included 50 patients in each arm, and they, what they found at, at the end of three years is the outcomes were no different, or we could say stat, uh, the, uh, number numerically, the outcomes were actually bad in the autologous stem cell transplant. But there was a lot of controversies in this trial, and hence, we do not have a clear data. So what are the various chemotherapy regimens? It started with melphalan plus dexamethasone, then it became BMDEX, that is bortezomib, melphalan, and dexamethasone. And now the most commonly used regimen is Cyborg-D regimen, which is cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, plus dexamethasone. And now we have a new drug that is Daratumab, which is called as a Dara Cyborg-D. Dara Cyborg-D uh, includes Daratumab, Daratumumab with Cyborg-D. Now, one thing is very clear, bortezomib-based regimens have better hematological response, better renal response, and better survival. So we, you need, we need to use bortezomib in all the therapies. And uh, the other thing which is now found is in the Andromeda randomized control trial, which compared bortezomib versus daratumab plus bortezomib-based regimen, and they found that dara cyborg has better outcomes than cyborg Now, there is a group of patients with AL amyloidosis in whom your baseline DFLC might be very low. So your baseline DFLC is less than 50. That is called as AL amyloidosis with low free light chain burden. Now, how will you treat this group of patients? Because the baseline itself is very low FLC. So what will you target? Your VGPR is already attained here. So in these patients, attainment of something called as stringent DFLC criteria, that is you try to attain a DFLC not less than 40, but less than 10 milligram per liter, that is associated with better survival. And this group of patients who have a very low DFLC at the beginning, protein urea, and if you attain a DFLC less than 10 milligram per liter, that will be associated with better overall survival. Now, the next group of disease is fibrillary or immunotactoid glomerular nephritis. As I said earlier, fibrillary GN are usually polyclonal as compared to immunotactoid, which is usually monoclonal. Now, if you look at the circulating monoclonal immunoglobulin, it is, is detected in most cases with immunotactoid. And the, 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 the lymphoproliferative disease can be detected in almost 50 percentage cases of immunotactoid. So that is the diff primary difference between fibrillary and immunotactoid. So this is a series of 73 cases of immunotactoid GN, wherein they found that almost 40 percentage patients had a B cell clone, that is a CLL or your SLL. And they found that 70% patients had monoclonal deposits. And these patients who had monoclonal deposits had a higher incidence of hematological disease. 
and more patients with these deposits ended up receiving a clonal therapy and lesser patients with monoclonal deposits progress to end-stage kidney disease. This is another series of 27 immunotactoid GN patients, wherein uh, out of 27, almost half of them had a B-cell clone, that is CLL or SLL, and 17 out of 27 had monoclonal deposits, and the most common deposit was IgG1. 21 received chemotherapy, 18 had renal remission, and 7 progressed to end-stage kidney disease, over 40, 40 months. Now, whenever you get a fibrillary or immunotactor GN, in addition to checking for your monoclonal gammopathy, you need to look at certain other conditions. For example, HCV is associated with both fibrillary and immunotactor. So you need to do a Q, HCV, PCR, and test check for your circulating cryoglobulins. Fibrillary is also associated with a lot of autoimmune diseases. Uh, the most common is Crohn's disease. So an autoimmune workup also needs to be done before labeling it as monoclonal gabopathy. How will you treat a fibrillary GN? The first thing you look at fibrillary, is it monoclonal or is it polyclonal? Majority of your fibrillary are usually polyclonal. If it is monoclonal, you look for, you search for a clone. That means you do a bone marrow uh, flow cytometry to detect a clone. If you detect a clone, you treat the clone. If it's a plasma cell clone, you give cyborg regimen. If it's a B cell clone, you give rituximab based regimen. Now, let's say you have a monotypic deposit, but you don't, you don't detect a clone, but you have a circulating immunoglobulin. So if you have a circulating immunoglobulin, see what type of immunoglobulin it is. Is it an IgM or a non-IgM? Majority will be non-IgM, which is IgG or IgA. You treat by, you treat by bortezomib. If it's an IgM, you give a B-cell therapy with rituximab. If you have monoclonal deposits, you don't have a clone, and you also don't have a circulating immunoglobulin, what do you do? Then you look at the clinical scenario. If there is renal, there is no much renal dysfunction and no much proteinuria, then go, don't go for any immunosuppressive or chemotherapic agents. Just give RAS blockers and follow up the patient. If you have renal dysfunction or proteinuria more than one gram, you look at what deposits you have in the kidney. Is it an IgM deposit or is it a non-IgM deposit? If it's a non-IgM deposit, you give rituximab. If it's an IgM, de uh, if it's a non-IgM deposit, you give bortezomib. If it's a no if it's an IgM deposit, you give rituximab. What about if it's a polytypic fibrillary GN? Polytypic fibrillary GN is not a monoclonal disease, so you treat just like the regimens how you treat the other fibrillary GN. So if the GFR is less more than 60 and there is no nephrotic range proteinuria, you don't use immunosuppressants. You just treat with RAS blockers and follow up. If there is a, a GFR less than 60 or nephrotic range proteinuria, you treat with rituximab. What about immunotactoid? Immunotactoid, the treatment is a little different because you know that 70% cases, there is a B-cell clone. So you first search for the clone. If you can detect a clone by your bone marrow flow cytometry or your blood flow cytometry, you treat the clone. Majority of the clone will be B-cell. You treat with rituximab. If you do not detect a clone, now you know that there is a high association with lymphoproliferative disorders. So if you do not detect a clone, you still treat the hypothesized B-cell clone with rituximab. So almost all cases, all cases of immunotactor GN will receive some form of therapy. Now coming to monoclonal C3 uh, GN. Now how does monoclonal, how does C3 GN can cause, uh, how can monoclonal uh, gammopathy cause C3 GN? So this is caused mainly, there are two hypotheses. The first hypothesis states that uh, there is a production of this monoclonal antibody against the inhibitors of alternate pathway, like your complement factor H or complement factor I and or complement factor B. So when there is a monoclonal antibody against the inhibitors, the, what happens is that uh, the alternate complement pathway gets activated and you get C3 deposits in the kidney. The second hypothesis is that this monoclonal immunoglobulin acts, acts, acts as a C3 nephritic factor. C3 nephritic factor is nothing but your alternate C3 convertase. So that activates your C3 pathway, alternate C3 pathway, and you get monoclonal C3 deposits. So whenever you get monoclonal C3 deposits, again, you need to rule out other common conditions because it's very rare that monoclonal disease causes C3 GN. So there are two associations, one uh, which you can get with dense deposit disease is your ocular drunsen, which is nothing but deposits within the Brux membrane of your retina. 
uh, similar to what you get in age-related macular degeneration. And second is something which is called as your acquired partial lipodystrophy, where in the upper half of your body, there is loss of fat. So these two associations you should, should keep in mind. You need to check for your complement levels because low C3 is a finding that you get in C3GN as well as dense deposit disease. You have to work up for your autoantibodies like your anti-factor H antibody, anti-factor B and anti-C3B antibody. And you also need to do a genetic panel to look for whether this disease is because of complement mutation. If everything is negative, then you label this as your monoclonal gammopathy. Now, do you treat your monoclonal gammopathy? So this is a series. This is the largest series of 50 patients with the monoclonal C3 glomerular nephritis. And uh, uh, almost half of the patients, more than half of the patients had only MGRS. Now, they gave chemotherapy to 29 out of 50. A majority received bortezomib-based therapy. And half of the patients were given not were given immunosuppressants or RAS blockers. And they found that the renal response and kidney response was better in the targeted group. And renal response and kidney response was better in those who attained your VGPR. Now, how do you treat monoclonal C3 uh, gammopathy? You first do a bone marrow for uh, to detect a clone. If you detect a plasma cell clone, you treat with cyber D. If you don't have a plasma cell clone, a B cell clone, then you treat with rituximab. If you have a monoclonal GN, but you cannot detect a clone, but you have still have a circulating monoclonal immunoglobulin, you use the same principle. Is it an IgM or non-IgM? If it's IgM, you give B-cell therapy, that is rituximab. If it's non-IgM, you give plasma cell therapy. Light chain proximal tubulopathy, there are only few case, uh, case series. This is one of the largest case series of light chain Fanconi syndrome. These patients had MGRS in majority of the cases, and the most common isotype was Kappa light chain. And they gave chemotherapy to 42 out of 49 patients, and uh, bortezomib was given to 11 of these patients. And what they found was a better response, a renal response, as well as hematological response, as well as improvement in your tubular function. Whereas the patients who did not receive chemotherapy progressed to end-stage kidney disease. This is 46 patients of right, light chain proximal tubulopathy. Uh, they classified them into crystalline and non-crystalline. Majority were crystalline. Crystalline patients all had kappa restriction and non-crystalline one-third had lamba restriction. Majority of patients had only MGRS and 38% patients had Fanconi's and all these were crystalline LCPT. They found that those who were given chemotherapy had a better response. Now, this is uh, one. Uh, this is our work on PGNMID, which is a, again a rare cause of uh, MGRS. This has this is uh, uh, this is work by my colleague Joseph Johnny. It's currently in uh, review in uh, IJN for uh, acceptance. Now, we looked at our native kidney biopsies from 2013 to 2020, and we picked up 16 cases of PGNMID with a biopsy incidence of 0.1 percentage. The mean age was 41 years. Majority had hypertension. There was equal males and females. 87% uh, age patients had uh, non-visible hematuria. Majority had nephrotic range proteinuria. 87% had nephrotic range uh, proteinuria. Median EGFR was 35 and the low C3 was seen only one third of the cases. There were no extra renal manifestation scenes. What we found is serum protein electrophoresis was positive in 37% uh, cases. Urine uh, BJP was positive in 18% cases. Immunofixation electrophoresis was positive in 25% cases. And serum-free light chain assay was positive in 38% cases. Only one patient met the criteria of a multiple myeloma. None of the patients, we did immunohistochemistry in most of the patients, none of the patients had light chain restriction. When you looked at the pattern, biopsy pattern, Majority had a membranoproliferative pattern. A uh, uh, quarter of patients had crescents. The most, most common heavy chain was IgG. And the both light chain, both kappa and lambda, we found it to be almost equal, unlike previous studies which said that kappa is more common. We, got, we did an EM in all the cases, and uh, the most common deposits, 80% was seen in subendothelium. A uh, quarter of patients uh, received RAS blockers. A uh, majority were treated by either conservative therapy or immunosuppression, what we use for GN therapy. And only two patients were given plasma cell therapy. And what we found was a very high rate of kidney failure. 38% patients 
progress to kidney failure. However, only one patient developed multiple myeloma during the follow-up period. And when we looked at the predictors of kidney failure, what we found that patients who have a non-MPGN pattern, any pattern other than MPGN, and patients who had more chronicity in the form of glomerular sclerosis, they were more likely to progress to kidney failure. Now, we compared the, a group of patients who had a circulating immunoglobulin versus the group of patients who had no circulating immunoglobulin. We found that those patients with the circulating immunoglobulin had a lower EGFR, they had more proteinuria, they had a higher kappa-lambda ratio, they had more percentage of plasma cells in bone marrow. However, the renal outcomes did not differ between the two groups. Now, there is a huge cry for a clone-directed therapy in PGNMID, and studies are showing that when you treat patients with a clone-directed therapy, they are more likely to respond. So this is a series of three case series where they compared patients who were treated with clone-directed therapy, uh, immunosuppression used in GN versus conservative RAS blockers, and they found that uh, renal remission rates were significantly higher if you used a clone-directed therapy. So this is what we had sent, uh, this picture we had sent as a figure to IGN for our publication, in which we classified again patients of PGNMID based on whether you can detect a clone or not. So the same principle is here. If you can detect a plasma cell clone, you give autosomy-based therapy. If you cannot detect a clone, you look at the immunoglobulin, circulating immunoglobulin. If it is a non-IgM, you give autosomy. If it's an IgM, we give rituximab. If you cannot detect a clone, if you cannot detect uh, 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 a circulating immunoglobulin, you look at the clinical scenario. If patients have renal dysfunction and proteinuria more than one gram, then you look at what is there in the kidney. If it's an IgM deposit in the kidney, you give rituximab. If it's a non-IgM deposit, which is more common, you give bortezomib. Now, do, should we treat MGRS in an end-stage kidney disease patient, wherein the chance of uh, saving the kidney is negligible? You treat it only if you're planning for a kidney transplant, or if there is an extra renal involvement, like your cardiac involvement in ALMyelodosis. Why is it important to treat patients before transplantation? This is because of a high recurrence rate. So this is 26 PGNMID patients who underwent kidney transplantation, and they were followed up with protocol graft biopsies. They found a recurrence of 89%, which was majority, which was an early recurrence. And the most common immunoglobulin was IgG3. And 20, only 20% 20 patients had a circulating para protein, and 50% patients lost their graft over a median period of three years. This is another series wherein they looked at all kinds of MGRS patients uh, who were un who underwent kidney transplantation, and they found again that those patients who were not treated well, who were not treated prior, who did not attain remission prior to kidney transplantation, had a very high rate of recurrence. This is another series of 19 amylodosis patients in whom one group received a kidney transplant followed by a bone marrow transplant. Another group received bone marrow transplant followed by kidney transplant. And third group did a kidney transplant after attaining complete remission. But the numbers are very small to make any analysis. And they found that the survival was similar in all three groups. So we do not know what is the right approach, whether we should do a kidney transplant followed by a bone marrow, or we should do a kidney transplant, bone marrow followed by a kidney transplant. Now, I would like to end up with an interesting case which we had seen last year. This is a 61-year-old female who is a type 2 diabetic for, for since 2017. Uh, she had a sensory motor peripheral neuropathy. She had no macrovascular complication. She was also known hypertensive since 2017. She presented with periorbital puffiness for six months. And uh, when, when we went through her labs, which were done at, the, at another center, we found that she had a normal creatinine in 2020, and it, there was a mild renal dysfunction in 2021. Her urine dipstick was 1 plus in 2020, which became 2 plus in 2021. She had uncontrolled hypertension at presentation, but she had no pedal edema. We did a fundus examination. We found hypertensive changes of retinopathy, but no changes of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, her labs done at CMC showed uh, anemia, which was normocytic, normochromic. Other cell counts were normal. Her sugars were well controlled. Now her creatinine this time had increased from 1.5 to 2.8. Uh, her, her urine analysis showed 3 plus protein, but there were no active sediments. 
her urine protein creatinine ratio showed a nephrotic range proteinuria with a hypoalbuminemia her ultrasound showed normal sized kidneys as a protocol uh, all patients above 50 we do a spep so a serum protein electrophoresis showed a query band a query band means they were not sure whether there was a band but it was a query band in the gamma region a urine bjp was negative and a viral markers were negative so now what should be the next step so you have a renal dysfunction nephrotic range proteinuria hypoalbuminemia in a diabetic patient uh, with uh, with a query band in gamma region so we went ahead with a kidney biopsy so what were the clues that this was not a diabetic kidney disease one thing she did not have a diabetic retinopathy secondly she had a nephrotic range proteinuria with hypoalbuminemia which is not very common in diabetic nephropathy third she had a very good glycemic control which shouldn't have been the case if it was a diabetic retinopathy and fourthly we had a suspicious banding gamma region now we also did the other workup for monoclonal gammopathy that is immune fixation electrophoresis serum free light chain assay but we did not do a bone marrow because we thought we'll first see the kidney biopsy and then look at the other parameters and then decide so a kidney biopsy showed a nodular glomerular sclerosis so what you see here is you can see multiple nodules in all the glomeruli which uh, which on pass which is negative pass positive silver negative uh, eosinophilic uh, nodular glomerular sclerosis so what what are the dds of nodular glomerular sclerosis so the first dd which comes in our mind is diabetic kidney disease that is called as kimmelstein wilson lesion the other thing i remember as mgrs pathologies like amyloidosis midids fibrillary and immunotactoid can also cause nodular glomerular sclerosis and there are certain rare non mgrs pathologies also which can cause nodular glomerular sclerosis like collagen 3 glomerulopathy fibronectin glomerulopathy hypoxic conditions and in smokers idiopathic nodular glomerular sclerosis in smokers now this nodules what we had were of the same size it was uniformly distributed in all the glomeruli there was absence of glomerular basement membrane thickening there was absence of efferent and efferent hyaluronosis and there was absence of exudative lesions like fibrin caps and capsular drops these are all findings which go against your diabetic kidney disease so this proved that this most likely from the initial lm picture it looked like it's not a diabetic kidney disease then we look at the various stains so what we look at is the past stain silver stain congo red stain and dna jb9 stain past stain is usually positive in diabetic kidney disease and idiopathic nodular glomerular sclerosis in rest of the conditions it's weakly positive silver stain is positive only in diabetic kidney disease congo red is only positive in amyloidosis and dna jb9 is a ihc which is positive in fibrillary so our case showed that it was pass negative it was pass weak positive it was silver negative and congo negative so then the possibilities are either mydd fibrillary immunotactoid fibronectin or collagen 3 glomerulopathy the next step that we do is we look at the if the if what showed was it was an igg deposits which was seen within the glomeruli within the tubular basement membrane and within the vessels so you have igg ideally what we need to do is you need to do the typing of igg and find out whether it is igg 1 2 3 or 4 we do not have this typing currently in cmc so we were we had lack of this knowledge so now what we have now we have an igg deposit we have something which is pass negative silver negative and congo red negative then the possibilities that you can have is only these three it can either be mydd it can be fibrillary or it can be immunotactoid gn the next step would be to do a electron microscopy so electron microscopy showed what you can see here is electron dense punctate linear deposits along the tubular basement membrane so this is heavy chain deposition disease so this is a finding that you get in either light chain or heavy chain deposition disease but since in our case we had only igg deposits we did not have kappa or lambda monoclonality this is a igg this is igg heavy chain or gamma heavy chain deposition disease then we got a ife report which again showed igg lambda we got a serum free light chain assay which was normal the ratio in renal failure is 0.3 to 3.1 
So it, the ratio was 0.41, which is normal. We went ahead, did a bone marrow, which showed eight percentage plasma cells. So it's not meeting the criteria of multiple myeloma. We did a trifine biopsy, which showed again mild plasma cytosis. We did an immunohistochemistry and it showed, it did not show light chain restriction. That is because this is not a LCDD, it's a heavy chain deposition disease. An additional thing which we should have done, but which, which we didn't do, was we should have sent the bone marrow for a flow cytometry to detect the clone. So that we didn't do. So now what we have, we have, we have something which is, uh, we have an MGRS. It's not a myeloma. The lesion is heavy chain deposition disease. We have, we do not have a clone, but we have a circulating IgG because IFE showed it was IgG. So we have a non-IgM circulating monoclonal immunoglobulin. So what we do here, we treat just like, just the, we assume that this is a plasma cell clone and we give a cyborg D regimen. So what we started for this patient was a cyborg D regimen. How will we assess this patient? Can we look at the circulating monoclonal immunoglobulin? No, because our, serum, our light chains are normal. This is a heavy chain disease. So there is no way we can follow up uh, hematologically this patient. The only way we can follow up is looking at the renal response. You look at whether the protein urea reduces by 50% or if you look at whether the serum creatine is rising. So that is the only way we can assess for response in this patient. Just before ending, these are wire loop lesions. We know that viral loop lesions are because of subendothelial deposits and it is seen in lupus nephritis in SLE. But which MGRS lesion can present with viral loop lesions? So there is a type of PGNMID called as light chain only PGNMID. So I said that in PGNMID you have IgG3 which is common and which is Kappa which is common. But there is a group of PGNMID which can have only light chain. There is no heavy chain. So that group of light chain PGNMID are associated with subendothelial deposits, which can present as wire loop lesions. Fanconi syndrome uh, uh, can be seen in monoclonal gammopathy, but which anti-myeloma therapy can cause a Fanconi syndrome? That is linalidomide. So which condition? So whenever you have Fanconi syndrome and a monoclonal gammopathy, the possibilities are most commonly it's an LCPT. Less commonly, it can be an LCDD or AL amyloidosis. Or if you develop Fanconi syndrome after therapy for monoclonal gammopathy, you check if it's linalidomide, which was there in the regimen. This is LCPT. Which antimyeloma therapy can cause false positive serum protein electrophoresis uh, and IFE? So we said that there are many causes for uh, false positivity embanded on serum protein electrophoresis. One antimyeloma therapy can cause a false therapy, false positive, and that is a new monoclonal antibody that is daratumumab. So whenever you use daratumumab, do not follow up the patient with your SPEP. Your SPEP will be falsely positive. So you need to do something specific called as daratumumab specific hydra shift assay to remove this interference. So in conclusion, MGRS is a renal damage caused by monoclonal immunoglobulin not meeting criteria of myeloma. It can be classified as org organized and non-organized deposits. Uh, you do the following tests to look for the monoclonal immunoglobulin, that is your serum protein electrophoresis, immunofixation electrophoresis, serum-free light chain assay, and bone marrow examination. Additional workup would be fibrillary, for fibrillary and immunotectoid, you have to look for lymph uh, lymphomas by doing a PET-CT. Uh, a whole body PET CT, you have to look for HCV, and for fibrillary, you have to look for autoimmune diseases. For monoclonal C3 glomerulopathy, you have to look for uh, complement factor antibodies and genetic mutations of your alternate pathway. Clone directed therapy is associated with better outcomes. Attainment of VGPR is associated with better real outcomes. If you have an MGRS with a very low FLC burden, then if you attain a stringent DFLC criteria that is less than 10 milligram per liter, DFLC less than 10 milligram per liter, it's associated with better outcomes. If you do not have a, a, a clone that is diagnosed, if you treat the hypothesized clone, that is associated with better outcomes. And there's a high rate of recurrence after kidney transplantation. And management of MGRS involves a multidisciplinary approach involving pathologists, nephrologists, and hematologists. I'm very happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Elias John. Uh, that was quite an enlightening uh, discussion on MGRS. Uh, I think there's one question in the 
uh, Q&A chat box. And the question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, question is uh, in Crohn's disease or in HCV associated fibrillary GN, if you treat the underlying disease, is there a need for additional treatments with uh, rituximab? Yeah, so uh, fibrillary GN associated with autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease, first of all, there is no much, much data, but the therapy would be to treat the underlying disease. So that is why whenever you whenever you suspect a monoclonal fibrillary GN, you need to rule out all these entities because the therapy would be treatment of the underlying condition. If after treating the underlying condition, you do not achieve your remission, kidney remission, then the possibility of using rituximab if your EGFR is less than 60 or if you have a nephrotic range proteinuria. Thank you for that answer. Thank you. Uh, just one little question. Uh, when you have this uh, autologous uh, stem cell transplant, say for example, lymphoma, uh, you mentioned that you have TRM. So why this why this mortality comes with this uh, you know treatment? That, that, you know the, the TRM incidence is supposed to be pretty high. Uh, you mentioned. So why do you have this TRM? Yeah. So. Uh... So the, the problem here is now most of our data, first of all, is uh, in monoclonal gamopathy is from amylodosis. So yeah. a lot of argument in CMC, we have, lot, we have a group of amylodosis patients. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm actually looking into a retrospective series and I found a group of these amylodosis patients who actually gone and underwent an autologous stem cell transplant. So uh, the guidelines, what they say is you look for eligibility. If you're eligible and the eligible list is quite a big, I just put the major eligibility criteria. Uh, if you do not have multi-organ involvement, if you do not have a low blood pressure, if your cardiomyopathy status is good, if your overall life expectancy is very good. So in basically, it's a healthy patient with no, no much of multi-organ involvement, you go for an autologous stem cell transplant. But the problem with autologous stem cell transplant is prior to this transplant, you need to give melphalam. That's a very high dose of melphalam. Uh, that's around 100 milligram per meter square. And this causes a lot of toxicity. And then there is a any transplant in the first initial period, there is a high risk of infections. So as a result, what happens is the, the, the short-term outcomes, if you look, it may not be very, the difference may not be very visible. That is why the randomized trial also actually failed to show any benefit in the first three years. But if you choose the patients rightly and you, uh, you use the therapies, you use a bortezomib-based therapy upfront, then the chances of having a long-term remission is high. But there is no strong data to prove that. So another approach, what people's, what hematologists do is, uh, they first give, now because now the key, now even the randomized trial came in an era when bortezomib was not used. So it was a comparison between uh, MDEX versus uh, bone marrow transplantation. So we didn't have bortezomib at that time. So we do not know because the chemotherapy now is very good and very specific. So the another approach would be to use a bortezomib based chemotherapy, use four to six cycles, and you see if you attain VGPR. If you attain VGPR, you know that your outcomes are very good. If you do not attain VGPR, then this if this patient is eligible, maybe you can push this patient for an autologous stem cell transplantation. But the TRM, as you mentioned, is mainly seen in patients with cardiac involvement, patients who have a lower baseline blood pressure, patients who have a tendency to develop GI bleeds uh, because of hemiloid deposits in the, in the gut, and patients who are uh, more prone to develop infections. Thank you so much. So patient selection makes a key in prevent, in yeah. decreasing yeah. the PRF. Thank you. It's, so a, it's the same thing like when we do kidney transplantation. Sometimes yeah. you see some patients do very well. Some patients yeah. don't do very well. And you start thinking, oh, if this patient had been in kidney dialysis, probably he would have survived longer. And and, yeah. and the data shows that kidney transplantation is, is the gold standard. So again, it's your patient selection, the right patient selection and the right therapy. Now you have a lot of therapies. The problem is now the therapies are quite efficient. So I think... The first line would be utilizing the therapies upfront. Lot of the uh, lot of patients who we say idiopathic, uh, you see, uh, do have underlying etiologies, which probably we didn't have the capacity to look into the past. And probably, as you mentioned, in terms of the nodular glomerular sclerosis, now the differential diagnosis that exists that you can really investigate in terms of you know, even the monoclonal gammopathy, that the number of you know, histological pictures that can lead to that. And because of uh, monoclonal uh, 
uh, gamma pathway is very significant. So uh, we actually transplanted those individuals in the past without looking into anything. And we yeah. didn't even know it was between diabetic or non-diabetic. We would say the differential diagnosis, but not investigated. So those yeah. patients then, you know, the recurrence would have come. And then again, it's idiopathic. We do nothing post-transplant. You know, the biopsies, we yeah. see them again. With the recurrence, we do nothing. So this is a huge learning and changes that are coming in. And more and more complexity is coming in. And I see oncology now has a huge role to play because this is beyond the realm of a normal nephrologist who sees general nephrology and you know dialysis no this is this really needs a lot lot more of uh, you know capability time spent you know learning and experience looking at complex patients then delving into this complexity so i think thank you very very much this is a wonderful session a huge eye opener and you made it so simple and at the same time it looks now that there is so much to it you know thank you very much john thank you. so uh, thank you very much dr lloyd and uh... Uh, the the one thing what I would like to do in future is the problem is because we don't understand the we have kind of a good communication with our pathologists because yeah. they, they we talk to them quite a bit uh, when you yes. have uh, when in, when the question is usually should we treat should we not treat and the pathologist yeah. gives an idea of what is the ifta and yeah. what is the chronicity but we don't have a good rapport with the hematologist even in cmc i'll tell you there is yeah. there are different hematologists there are different nephrologists each of them have their own perspectives and there is no yeah. actual crosstalk between the hematologist and the nephrologist so what happens usually is when you see a mgrs you refer the if you just refer the patient to hematology what they yeah. do is they look okay there is no myeloma there is some lesion yeah. in the kidney and they will they will send the patient or they will send the patient back to you saying do you think you need to treat the patient so the, yeah. the best way forward I would see is to have a combined hematorenal yeah. clinic yeah. where yeah. all such patients are managed co yeah. combined by right. two groups of patients and we understand each other's problems yeah. because we don't yeah. understand chemotherapies very well. Yeah. We don't know yes. what are the real problems of starting the chemotherapy. We can just tell yeah. treat, treat, but we do not know how to. And on, and on the contrary, we are telling the hematologist to treat yeah. something yeah. which is not there even in the blood the question they yeah. ask is, okay, we'll treat. How do you assess the response? So we don't have an answer yeah. for that. So that yeah. can only be done by a combined hematorenal yeah. clinic, uh, yes. which uh, looks seriously into yeah. such cases. Yeah. A, a, a combined group, sometimes the I guess the patient load may be there, which probably will surface once you start the clinic. And then you'll realize yes, yes. that the load is huge. Yes, yes. And also, it needs a lot of awareness and uh, uh, and learning and teaching our colleagues in nephrology also. You see, because there's a lot of this is just goes under the carpet quite a bit. And this investigation yeah. now, I think there's a lot of learning coming with this. Uh, you know, differential diagnosis of MGRS is a really huge thing. Actually, the spectrum that you face is a lot. Thank I think you. what we do is now is any patient who is planning for a biopsy, age more yeah. than fifty, we do a serum protein electrophoresis, irrespective of what you're thinking. And if the serum protein electrophoresis shows something, or if the biopsy shows some evidence of MGRS, we do a immunofixation, serum-free lichate, and a bone marrow biopsy. Bone marrow biopsy and aspiration. So this should be, if you do this, at least we get the baseline data of which are the patients who are likely MGRS. Thank you, uh, Prof, uh, for this nice presentation. I echo uh, everybody's comments, and I thank you very much for making this complex uh, topic uh, fairly I would say easy to understand, uh, but I will uh, uh, visit and revisit this recording on YouTube because this is going to be my reference material for uh, MGRS. So maybe if I can just give you um, a case that I was referred uh, by a GP actually uh, in one of the sit uh, towns uh, far from where, where we are. So this is a 57-year-old lady who presented with uh, just muscle pains um, and uh, she on examination or basically she didn't really have much, no bone pain or anything, but they just did basic, you know, panel for her. Her HP was low at about 10.7. And uh, she had an abnormal creatinine of about 1.5 uh, milligrams per deciliter. So where, when she came in, given that she was 57 with these iffy pains um, and the elevated creatinine with a low HP, my suspicion was, look, I mean, it could be myeloma. So why don't we work this patient up for this? Uh, we did a urine, normal urine test for her and uh, she just had some two plus blood and um, trace protein. 
she is not diabetic she's not hypertensive um and uh because she had that i told uh, and my index of suspicion was high i said let's do a spep and a serum to elegans uh and see what's what's going on so total protein count was actually elevated and uh, we did the spep her albumin level was slightly high but her gamma globulin levels were also slightly high there was no monoclonal peak but the uh, serum free lichens that were done her ratio was about 3.5 so it is slightly um, elevated um so my concern was that uh, look i mean she doesn't meet the criteria for myeloma it could be a monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance at that time it was unknown because we didn't have a kidney biopsy now one problem that we have uh, here is we have kidney biopsy facilities however we do not have uh, immunofluorescence readily available and we do not have electron microscopy at all so i referred this patient to nerobi uh, for a kidney biopsy specifically asking for uh, you know for uh, electron microscopy and immunofluorescence so that we can see if this patient actually has uh, monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance However, when she went there, for some reason, she kind of got lost, or I don't know, the information never got to the doctors there. So she saw a hematologist who then decided to work her up for lupus. Now, a 57-year-old lupus doesn't really kind of make sense. But anyway, they, they did the tests, and the ANA was positive. And the extended markers were also positive. The Smith was positive, the SSA A and SSA B were positive. So she was actually diagnosed with lupus. and she was treated as lupus and then she kind of got lost to follow up so i'm not really sure what what actually happened to her but my concern and i told uh, the the gp that referred to me that yes she may have been diagnosed with lupus is very unlikely at this age to be diagnosed with lupus and she never really had any other criteria for for lupus uh but my concern is still that she may have a monoclonal gammopathy uh but the patient is lost to follow up so i'm not sure what happened to her but i don't know if this kind of you know make sense if you can put the whole picture together was my thought process on the right track um and uh, could there be say a false positive immunological markers for lupus whereas the patient actually has something else or is it that she has lupus but she's also presenting with a monoclonal gammopathy i don't know i don't have an uh, so I, i just need to know one question when you had yes. this urine analysis of uh, 2 plus blood and trace protein uh, did you yes. do a urine uh, uh albumin protein ratio uh Did no you... no no i asked for it but it wasn't done so i don't have the quantification of the protein urea okay and was a biopsy yeah. ever done finally in nairobi no. no no the kidney biopsy was not done because they just attributed it to lupus and they treated the lupus and that was it okay so one yeah. thing what i use it in my opd as a very simple thing like uh, one of my very seniors had told urine microscopy is just like a biopsy it's a non invasive yes. biopsy if you use yes. it and think properly and in yeah. monoclonal gammopathy i had a couple of cases wherein uh, after i made a few mistakes i realized is you just look at the urine analysis and you look mm. at your urine albumin creatinine ratio or if you have a urine mm. protein creatinine ratio it's better to look at yes. a urine uh, protein creatinine protein. ratio yes and yeah. if you find that your urine and if there is a dissociation that is yes. your urine yes. just like in this case it was trace and your urine yes. protein is something like 5 or 6 grams it is direct yes. clear yes. that there is some monoclonal immunoglobulin so yes. Yes. Uh, so that is one simple thing like one of the mm-hmm. cases of uh, i had a case like this uh, wherein a patient with who was diabetic was being had a biopsy biopsy showed nodular glomerular sclerosis but the immunofluorescence was not properly done um, i think it was not properly properly done or it was negative and patient had a nephrotic range proteinuria she was treated with all kind of therapies available she was on arb she was on uh, she was on uh, sclt2 inhibitor she was on finrenone all therapies mm. available for diabetic kidney disease but proteinuria did not move it was around 15 mm. to 20 grams always it did not move mm. and then she came mm. over here and then as a routine i did all the tests what what panels what we do and the urine routine showed trace protein and the mm. urine protein creatinine ratio was 15 grams so that was mm. a mm. very that that then there was not nothing needed only i needed a biopsy to see actually yes. uh, yeah. what 
is the MGRS lesion? Is it? I th I thought actually it would be something like an MIDD or uh, mm -hmm. amylodosis. It turned out to be mm -hmm. actually LCPT, light chain proximal tubulopathy, oh, wow. which I couldn't explain mm -hmm. why the proteinuria was so much. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is why probably, and there was nodular glomerular sclerosis. And when you have mm -hmm. a diabetic patient with nodular glomerular sclerosis, it always complicates your diagnosis. So I mm -hmm. think over here, the clue would have been if you had the proteinuria. And, and yeah. even if it was a lupus nephritis, uh, with a creatine of 1.5 and if there is proteinuria, I would definitely mm. biopsy to see what is the stage of lupus nephritis before yes. starting therapy. Because yes. uh, uh, otherwise, uh, if you, uh, it, it uh, the, because we know that each stage has a different uh, way of treating. Yes. So if it's a class yeah. four, then I would have been more aggressive with lupus nephritis. Yeah. So uh, anyway, yeah. she would have required a biopsy and a proteinuria. Mm. I'm not very convinced that 57 year old presenting with lupus nephritis at this age, um, yeah. um, but if it's not a very, uh, very uh, full blown thing, it can happen. Maybe she missed out or uh, anything, something like that. But I'm not very convinced it's lupus. Whether lupus yeah. can exist, coexist with myeloma, yes, you can exist. Anything can mm -hmm. coexist. But in medicine, we always try to stick to one diagnosis, one, one diagnosis to put everything yes. together. So I yes, think yes. When, when she, if she comes back, I think have a look at her protein urea. Yeah. And if possible, yeah. to get a so biopsy she... done. Yeah, so she, the person who referred to me uh, is like 700 kilometers from here. It was actually an online consult because he's a, he's a, he's a GP and okay. he sees the, these patients and uh, whenever he has tricky patients, he just calls me and then we kind of have a discussion and I guide him on to what to do. So I never really saw this patient, right? Okay. But when I saw this picture and, uh, you know, given the criteria that I mentioned, her age and the anemia and the renal dysfunction, first thing that came to mind was myeloma and I told him, let's work her up for myeloma. Unfortunately, okay. there was a lot of, um, I think, uh, miscommunication perhaps from the patient side or maybe she was overwhelmed. But when she went to the other center, it, it wasn't done the way, you know, we wanted to because ideally she should have had, get, gotten a kidney biopsy either way because she had yeah. uh, identifying uh, features, but that was, was never done. Anyhow, if this was perhaps lupus, she was started on MMF, so perhaps uh, you know uh, it, it may be helpful for her. But though I agree, yes, she, she needs a kidney biopsy. I always I always tell my fellows and my juniors that uh, you know a kidney biopsy is just like if you don't have a kidney biopsy in a GN, it's just like driving a car with your eyes closed. You don't know where you're going, and you're going to run into trouble. So you need to do a kidney biopsy. And that's that's yeah. the goal. Yeah. Thanks, Prof. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Elias. Thank you, Dr. Maza. I think uh, there are no more questions in the chat box. So on behalf of uh, AHN, our sponsors and panelists, I would want to really thank you for making time to do this uh, presentation today. It was quite enlightening. And uh, waiting to see you back again for other presentations uh, that are quite an eye-opener from what we are seeing in this series. So I'll just uh, wish to give it to Dr. Lloyd for any closing remarks uh, for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Sony. That was a wonderful session. <laughs> it's a huge eye-opener. And I think there's so much of change that is coming uh, and, you know, oncolephrology. And actually, this is, uh, if you see the poster that sent out, uh, this is going to be the first of a series of oncolephrology. So I would like you to come back again. Uh, we have a number of talks now in oncology lined up for the year. So I think uh, it is the third, usually the third week, uh, the third or third or fourth week uh, of the month will be a topic in oncology. There are 10 or 15 topics that are there. We'll have to slowly cover it. So that is the plan. It's a very, very important and emerging field that I think uh, so far was unknown probably and now coming up. So thank you very much, Sony. It's a, a huge first session and a wonderful session indeed. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Lloyd. It's always a big pleasure to come and speak over here. I consider it as a big honor actually to speak.